Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. I'm going to get into the word of the Lord tonight. Anybody excited about the word of God tonight? Yeah. You guys are. I can tell. Listen. Never go to church to hear from a man or a woman. We didn't come into this place to hear from the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, the tall, the short, any other type of man. Listen, this is about us coming together and hearing from the Holy Spirit who is the teacher of the church. So tonight, if you would honor the Lord, if you can, stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer as we approach his word tonight. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful for your presence already in this place. As we've praised and worshiped you, lifted our hands to you, lifted our voices and our hearts, God, thank you for showing up and doing your wonderful work. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for all those who came and cast their cares, God. We thank you, Lord, that you care, God, and that you have just ministered to them this night, God. Comfort and strength, encouragement and grace, God. Lord, we praise you. How awesome you are, God. Tonight, God, as we approach your word and open it up, we pray that you open it up to us. Open us up to receive. God, we pray that you open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Come, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Direct us and give us the vision, the wisdom that each and every one of us need for our individual lives, Lord. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. No time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else. But we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, we do remember the persecuted church in Egypt as well as in the Middle East and different parts all over the world. Bless them, comfort them, strengthen them, be with them, God. Give them special grace, Lord, for our brothers and sisters around the world that are preaching and teaching the gospel. Bless them, Lord. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostal, Calvary Chapels. Thank you for Harvest in Oak Valley. Lord, for the way and the well, God, we just praise you and thank you for Ecclesia, Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, God, for our Catholic brothers and sisters, our Adventist brothers and sisters, all the great churches that are out there preaching the gospel, Lord. We pray that you bless them as you bless us this night. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, Amen. Amen. Tonight, grab your Bibles and go with me to the book of Judges. We're going to be in Judges chapter number two, end of chapter number two, as a matter of fact. You can go ahead and turn there. And while you're turning there, let me let you know what the title of tonight's message is. The title of tonight's message is actually a question. A question that we probably all asked ourselves. Maybe we asked someone else. Maybe even asked God this question at one time or another. And here's the question. Why me? Now, some of you are laughing because you've asked that question. I know there's been times where things have happened in my life that I said, why me? You know, why not that guy? Why not someone else? Why not this person? Why, why of all people did this happen to me? Now, I believe that when we approach the Word of God, that the Word of God has all the answers that we need for life. There are some things this side of heaven that we will not know. Some things this side of heaven that we're going to have to wait. Sometimes God, in his responses and in his answers to us, says, not now. Sometimes he says it will be revealed. Sometimes he says different things. We, we do understand that. But I believe that this question, why me, has some answers that we can see in the Bible that are going to help us. See, my job as a pastor is equip you and build you and strengthen you and get God on the inside of you so that when you leave this place that you're equipped to do what? To do the work of the ministry. To, to go and minister to your families, to go and minister to your communities, to be the best dad or husband or father or mom or sister or wife or worker, or employee, best laborer in the field of God, going out there and telling someone about Jesus, the best witness you can be, the best person you can be for Jesus Christ. And when we ask these types of questions, sometimes we kind of just write them off and we say, well, that's probably the wrong question. And, I, you know, I know that, that God cares about me and I, I know that bad stuff just kind of happens and, and maybe there's a purpose, maybe there's not. But I believe as we look in the Word of God, we find out that God answers questions like this. Anybody want to know what the answer to the question is? All right, well, we're going to discuss that tonight. One of these questions, one of these questions that I've had over the years just like this why me question, one of the questions that, that I thought about for years was about Joshua. Here Joshua is, Moses has taken the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. He's taken them through the wilderness wandering and now he's gotten to the edge. We know that Moses passed the baton over to Joshua. Joshua is the one that actually takes the children of Israel into the promised land. 
Miracles are taking place. The, the waters of the Jordan part and they heap up at a certain place and they all cross. Then what happens? The walls of Jericho come falling down. They, all they did was march around it seven times and blow the trumpets, right? And so miracles are taking place. During one of the battles, Joshua speaks and says, sun stand still until the Lord takes vengeance on his enemies and the sun stands still in his place until they're able to wipe out all of their enemies. Now, with all of this, we never read in the Bible that Joshua, at the end of his life, got off track, got off course, did the wrong thing. Joshua maintained the direction. Joshua fulfilled his purpose. Joshua followed the instruction of the Lord. Now, with all of that, here comes the question, why was there still the nations that Joshua was supposed to wipe out in the land? That was one of my questions. God, why? Why? Kind of like that why me thing. God, why, why? Why? What's going on here? And for a long time, I didn't understand this until I started to read the end of Joshua into the book of Judges. And that's why I had to turn there. Judges chapter 2 starts to talk about why this took place. Judges chapter 2, starting in verse number 20, we're going to read through verse number 23. We're going to find out what the purpose, why were these nations still left? If Joshua didn't get off course, why didn't they get wiped out? Here, miracles, signs, wonders were taking place. Joshua was taking the children of Israel in. He maintained his course. At the beginning of Judges, you find out that after, even after Joshua was gone, children of Israel started out good, started to go up, started to take possession of the land, started to wipe out the nations, but something happened. Judges chapter 2, verse 20 through verse 23. Judges chapter 2, starting in verse number 20, look at this. Then the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and has not heeded my voice. Now, if you read into Judges chapter 2, you will find out that they started to worship the idols of the land. They started to intermarry with the nations that were around them. They, rather than wipe them out, they put them to forced labor. That was not the instruction of God. They have transgressed his commandment. Now God is angry. It says that he, the, Lord, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, because... This nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and has not heeded my voice. They didn't listen to me. Look at this, verse 21. I will also no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died. Now, that sounds like Joshua failed, but hold on. Let's read on. Verse 22. So that through them I may test Israel whether they will keep the ways of the Lord to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. Verse 23. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them into the hand of Joshua. So we find out that it's not that Joshua failed or did anything wrong. It's because God had a purpose and a plan. God had something in mind that he was going to do. He was going to test Israel with what? With the nations that were surrounding them. God was going to check and see whether or not they would continue to serve him in the midst of adversity. Are you listening tonight? And so sometimes when we approach the Word of God, when we approach life, and we take a look at the two, we haven't read the rest of the story yet. We haven't seen it from God's perspective yet. We've got one side of the story saying, God, I did everything right. God, it's not because I was in sin. God, it's not because I sowed bad seed. So why is this stuff still taking place in my life? Why am I still encountering adversity in life? Why is it hard? Why is it tough? Why did I get the pink slip when I was believing you, God? Why did we lose the house when we were believing you, God? Why am I still having financial troubles even though I'm tithing, God? Why, why is the, the husband or the wife left even though I was praying and quoting scriptures? God, what's taking place in my life? Why? Why me? God says, I've got answers for you. I've got some answers for you. Tonight, a couple of things we're going to take a look at from the Word of God that answer that question. Now, maybe tonight you've been wondering about this, and it's going to answer that question. Maybe tonight it won't. But I believe that if you press into the Spirit of God tonight, and that if you listen and open your ear, God will speak to you about your situation. It may not be out of something I said, but the Spirit of God will just reveal something, bang, right into your heart. And you're going to understand and know about your situation. Why me? Well, here's why. A couple of reasons tonight we're taking a look at. Why me? Here's why. Number one, because you're a Christian. Number one reason why me? Well, because you're a Christian. I love what G.K. Chesterton said. He said, Jesus promised his disciples three things. That they would be completely fearless, absurdly happy, and in constant trouble. Isn't that awesome? What did Jesus say? He said, in the world you will have 
trouble, tribulation, right? Trials, pressures, problems. That's how the world is designed. In the world, you will have trouble. Now, we can finish the sentence, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world, right? We know the end of the story. And we can rejoice even though we're facing the midst of problems and trials and tribulations because we know that Jesus has overcome. And as we stay in him, we are overcomers and we don't have to be brought down by that. But let's be wise enough to listen to the first part of that sentence which says, in the world, you will have trouble. Not you may. Not it could happen to you. Not if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, bad stuff's going to happen. No. In the world, you will have trouble. Regardless of how you live, regardless of how you act, you're going to have trouble. It's a promise. One of those promises you don't have to believe God for and confess over your life. Just let it happen, right? John chapter 15. You're there in Judges. Remember where that's at in your Bible. We'll go back to Judges later on. But turn me to the book of John, New Testament, Gospel of John. John chapter number 15. John chapter 15, we're going to start in verse number 18 and read through verse number 20. Jesus is speaking. These are red letter, and those of you who have the red letter Bibles, you can read that. These are the words of Jesus. He's speaking to his disciples, talking to them about this. The fact that you're a Christian, the fact that you're one of his disciples, things are going to happen. Why you? Here's why. Because you're a Christian. John chapter 15, starting in verse number 18. Read through verse number 20. Take a look at it with me. It says, Jesus speaking, he says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. See, sometimes we stop and we say, well, why me? Why, why am I having this problem? Why does everybody on the job hate me? People were cool with me until they asked me what I did this past weekend, and I said, church, all of a sudden everything changed. Why? How come when I gave my heart to Jesus... It seemed like all hell broke loose against me. How come when I started to do things God's way and wasn't just a lazy Christian anymore and started getting going, why did the resistance start? Here's why. Because if the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. Here's Jesus, God in the flesh, the Christ, and what happens? The world delivers him over to be crucified. Wow. So he says, this is not unusual. This is not out of the ordinary. If... The world hates you. Know that they first hated me. Why? Because you're a Christian. You know what Christian means? It means little Christ. Bunch of little Jesus is running around on the earth. That's why the devil hates you is because you look like your father. And the devil got whipped and kicked out of heaven and knows that he's going to destruction. Therefore, he hates you. Why? Because you remind him of his end. He wanted your place. See, you declare the high praises of God. You are now a priest of God and a king in in, in God's family. See, the devil wanted all that. He wanted to be exalted, and yet he was brought low. And now when he looks at you, he sees, oh, they took my place. They supplanted me. That's why we're called Israel. Jacob, supplanter. See, and he hates you now. If the world hates you, know that it hated him first. Next verse, verse number 19. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. See, if you were not a Christian, you'd be just fine with the world. The world would pat you on the back, give you everything you wanted, love on you, kiss you, all that kind of stuff. Why? Because you're of the world. But take a look at this. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Because you're following Jesus. Now all of a sudden the pressure's on. Now that you're following Jesus, you are marked. You've got a bullseye on your back just because you're a Christian. Verse 20, remember that the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. What is Jesus saying? He says, listen, God has many sons, none without trouble, even Jesus. If Jesus went through problems and trials while on the earth, then what makes us think we're going to sidestep it? What makes us think that it's just a bed of roses? No, no. If we're following Jesus, Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. That is not a pathway to comfort and leisure and all that kind of stuff. No, that's a pathway to pain and suffering and death. And so Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you're going to follow my way, you're going to overcome, but you're going to have to go through problems. You're going to have to go through trials, going to have to go through pain. Why you? Well, because you're a Christian. Love what uh, Winston Churchill said. Winston Churchill was prime minister of England at the time of war. And listen to what he said. He said, the question which we must ask ourselves is not whether we like or do not like what is going on, but what we are going to do about it. 
See, as Christians, it's not to sit there and say, oh, woe is me, why me? Why is the devil picking on me? Why is the world picking on me? I never did anything to them. I'm just trying to love them. I'm just trying to be a good Christian, and I don't want any trouble. I'll leave you alone, you leave me alone. No, not do you like it or not like it. This is how it is, Christian. This is what you enrolled in. This is what you signed up for. And now that you are a Christian, it's not about whether you like or don't like it. It's what are you going to do about it? How are you going to handle yourself? See, you have been enlisted into the Lord's army, and as the Lord's soldier now, you're going to have to go out there in war. You're going to have to get tough. You're going to have to get mean. You're going to have to kick some devil butt. You're going to have to go after it. See, that's what God is saying. Not do you like it. What are you going to do about it? Love what the Apostle Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, verse 3. Take a look at it with me. 2 Timothy 2, verse 3. Just put it up. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. See, that's what we're going to do about it. When we go through problems, we're not going to sit back and bawl and squall and cry and bellyache. No, we're going to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We're going to go through the problem. We don't camp in the valley of the shadow of death. We go through the valley of the shadow of death. Are you listening tonight? Amen. It gets better as we go, I promise. I promise. Why me? Why me? Here's why. Here's why. Second thing is to drive you to God. To drive you to God. God knows us. God knows us. God knows man. God knows our hearts. And throughout history, if you read your Bible, you will find that every time the children of Israel started to wander and there was raised up a persecutor, they went to the Lord. That's what the whole book of Judges is all about. It's about a cycle. God is showing us this is the natural tendency. That things get good, we get away from God, we get distracted with things, we get distracted with ourselves, we get distracted with stuff, we get off God. Now all of a sudden, here comes a persecution, here comes a trial, here comes a problem and a pressure, and that pressure drove the children of Israel where? Back to God. God would deliver them. God would hear their cry. God would raise someone up for them that would deliver them and lead them. Now once that deliverer was gone, once that judge was gone, what happened? They got comfortable, they got back into their old ways, started serving other gods and got away from God. And that cycle goes around and around and around and around. And today, in our hearts, we have to be careful that it's not that same cycle. See, these are not just stories contained in Scripture as a history lesson for us. These are examples, the Bible tells us in the New Testament, of how we should live or not live. This is how we should order our life. These are the pitfalls and the things to watch out for. These are the successes and the things that we should follow and imitate. And therefore, when you see a cycle in the Word of God, that cycle we need to know is a part of our nature, a part of our sin nature, that when things get good, the tendency is to back off God. And therefore, we need to realize that problems in our life may not be because we've done the wrong thing, maybe because we're getting distracted, we're getting off course. God is saying, I don't want you going there. I want you to come here. And therefore, these problems and pressures in our life will drive us to God. Psalms, book of Psalms, chapter 78, talks about the history of Israel. Psalm 78, if you want to turn there with me, go ahead. Psalm 78. Talks about the history of Israel coming out of Egypt and the great and mighty works which God did for them. Psalm 78, verse number 34, and verse number 35. Take a look. Very interesting when you take a look at what we're talking about today. Psalms chapter 78, verse 34, and verse 35. Look at verse 34. It says, when he slew them, then they sought him. Isn't that interesting? I, I picture, because of the terminology that he's using here, when he slew them, that is a picture of God taking out a sword and slaying them. It wasn't until God did something so opposite of what they thought God should be doing that they finally sought him. See, God knows how this works. God knows what to do. God knows how to get our attention. God has our number. God knows our address. God's even got our email and our Twitter and our Facebook accounts. See, God knows how to get a hold of us. And sometimes we think that God should be this pie-in-the-sky type God where you pull a lever and the blessings fall down and, and everything should be rainbows and roses and, and, and God should just be loving and kind and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we picture Jesus we're walking with like a bear and a dog and birds chirping and all that kind of stuff and, you know, rainbows all around and all that kind of stuff. And yet here God is pictured as a man with a sword slaying somebody in order to get them back to him. That's not the way that we think he should be doing things. 
But God's ways are higher than our ways. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. When he slew them, then they sought him. And they returned and sought earnestly for God. Wasn't just a casual thing. No, they realized where they were at. The fact that God was now against them woke them up and shook them up to the point where they didn't just seek God, they earnestly sought God. Look at the next verse. Verse number 35. Then they remembered that God was their rock and the most high God, their redeemer. See, God wants us to remember these things. God wants us to know that this is not about us, this is about him. God wants us to know that we need to cling to him for our breath, for our life, for our every bit of our being. In him we live and move and breathe and have our being, the New Testament says. And therefore God says when problems arise, don't look around, don't look to why me. No, look to God. Run to God, cling to God. God wants to drive you to himself. You're there in the Psalms. Turn to these Psalms 119. Take a look at this. Psalms 119. Verse number 67, Psalm 119, verse number 67. Amazing when you take a look at what we're talking about. Psalm 119, verse 67, look at this. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. What does that mean? That means when times were good, I wandered. Times were good, I was unrestrained. Times were good, undisciplined. Much like the prodigal with his inheritance. When stuff is going good, hey, let's party. Let's have a good time. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, but now, but now that I'm afflicted, now that there's a problem, now that there's pain, now that there's a trial, but now, look at this, I keep your word. Whereas before, I went astray. See, sometimes we look at problems as so bad, it's just so bad, I, I hate this, I can't stand this, why is this going on, why me? And yet God is saying it's not so bad, it doesn't have to be this way, I want you to run to me, come to me, I will solve the problem, I will fight on your behalf, I go before you, I will surround you, I will take care of you in the midst of this, but you gotta come, you gotta draw near. You draw near to him, he draws near to you. Are you listening tonight? Why me? Well, here's why. A couple of reasons. Number one, because you're Christian. Number two, because God wants to drive you to himself. And number three for tonight, why me? Well, here's why. Number three, to develop your character. To develop your character. Pastor Dan, did you really have to go there tonight? Yes, I did. I did. This is one of the most obvious ones because it's so prevalent in Scripture. We can go through numerous Scripture upon Scripture upon Scripture about how problems develop character in our life. Now, again, if we had it our way, me personally, if I had it my way, God, here's how I want to develop character. I want to go through good things and learn from the good, right? We all would say that's the best way to develop character. Why? Because we don't want to go through problems. And yet God hasn't designed life that way, and honestly, we don't learn that way because when good things happen, we think everything's hunky-dory and we just keep going the way that we were going. Nothing changes. But when you encounter a problem or a trial, when something happens and you throw your hands up and you say, why me? When you realize that it's going to develop something in you that you need not just for this life but into eternity. See, your character you're going to take with you into eternity. Your life, the, the person that God is developing you to be, see, there will come a day when you will be perfected. You will get a new body, so nature's gone. But listen, your experiences on earth are not meaningless. There is a purpose, and God is developing godly character in you that is going to last into eternity. God doesn't want you a weak and beggarly Christian. God wants you a strong, faith-filled Christian, believing him on the earth, ruling and reigning with him. Why? Because you're going to rule and reign with him forever. God is getting you ready for the throne, for eternity with him. And therefore, God is developing this character. Very familiar verse, James chapter 1, back to the New Testament. In the book of James chapter 1, back there past Hebrews, you'll find the book of James. If you're with us on Sundays, you know where Hebrews is. Book of James chapter 1, James chapter 1, right off the bat, verse number 2, he just launches into this thing and starts talking about problems, starts talking about trials and pressures. Look at this, James chapter 1, verse number 2. Read it with me. If you can quote it, quote it with me. Look at this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, once again, that's so opposite of what we think. 
We fall into various trials, and what do we do? We cry. We say, why me? We start to do the blame game. It must be your fault. I must be in sin. What's wrong? God, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with them? Yet God says, count it all joy. Don't even worry about all that other stuff. Just start to rejoice. Start to smile. Start to laugh. Listen, you really want to confuse the devil and your enemies? Just start to laugh when pressures come on you. Start to smile. Start to just throw your head back. <laughs> hey, that's great. I'm so glad this is happening. Count it all joy. Why? Verse number three, knowing. Everybody say knowing. Knowing, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. That word that we all hate. Or it could also be translated endurance or perseverance. It, it, it really means that you could stand up under something. The testing of your faith produces perseverance, much like somebody who's weight training. When they start with a certain weight, they can smile and rejoice. Why? Because they know that when they come to the next level and the next set of weights, they're going to be able to bear it. They're going to be able to get underneath it. Why? Because they were tested at this level. Now they're going to a new level. Something developed in them that now they're able to handle more. They're stronger. They can go longer. And now God is showing us something in the natural that now we can apply to the spiritual. Count it all joy, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Verse 4, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. See, we want to be perfect. We want to be complete. We want to be lacking nothing, but we don't want to go through the pain of the process to get to the perfection. Let me say that again. Me, you, we don't want to go through the pain of the process to get to the perfection. Listen, I'm putting myself in this mix too, okay? Because when I look at pain, I don't say, oh, yay. It's not my initial response. I have to get myself there. I have to find the joy. I have to cling to God. I have to get driven to God when problems and pressures hit. Most of the time it starts out, oh, me, not amen. Are you listening? And so, but we got to know something. See, when you can get your mind off of the problem and now you can realize that God is doing something, God's producing something in me, I must be strong enough to handle this. Thank you, Jesus, that you put this on my life. And guess what? I'm going to bear up under it. And I know that on the other side of this pain, on the other side of this problem, on the other side of this process, there is something good going to take place. I'm going to be perfect. I'm going to be complete. I'm going to be lacking nothing. I'm going to be well equipped for life in this life and in the one to come. Romans chapter 3. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Turn there with me. Turn there with me. Great section of scripture. Talking about developing our character through the process of problems, pain, trials, pressures. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 5. Not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. That sounds kind of like counting it all joy when we encounter various trials, doesn't it? But now it's not just counting it all joy. We glory in it. What is that glory? That's the manifested goodness of God, right? So now we start to display and we start to open up and show everyone the goodness of God in what? Tribulations, trials on earth, pressures, problems, pain, knowing. Everybody say knowing. knowing. See, these are things we ought to know about problems, things we ought to know about life. Knowing what? Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. There's that term once again, patience, endurance, perseverance. But perseverance produces something. Look at this, verse 4. And perseverance, character. See, God is producing character in us when we endure trials. And character, hope. And you say, but pastor, I've, I've had hope before and my hope was not fulfilled and I got downcast. I don't want to hope anymore. I don't want to believe anymore. When I go through problems, I, I, I cringe at believing God because I've been disappointed. But take a look at the next verse because we don't hope like the world hopes. No, our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is a confident expectation that no matter the outcome, I'm believing God and God's going to handle it. God's going to take care of it. God's going to fight for me. God's going to do something. Look at this verse number five. Now hope does not disappoint. Why? Because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is the guarantee. 
He is the seal. He is the stamp at the end of it all. And he has shed the love of God abroad in our hearts. Now, we know that if God loves us, that if we have the Holy Spirit, the power of God, the ability of God, the grace of God, we've got all this available to us, doesn't matter the outcome on earth. Doesn't matter circumstances, doesn't matter problem, doesn't matter trial, doesn't matter pain, doesn't matter pressure, none of that matters. So you lost the job, guess what? God's got a better job, and if he doesn't, he'll take care of you through it all. Okay, so you lost the house. Listen, God will take care, put a roof over your head. God will provide for your needs. God will get you a better house. Believe God. But if he doesn't, you'll still be okay because you've got an eternal dwelling. You see, we get so locked into here and now and this stuff. And I was believing God for this, and I didn't get this. Well, God is saying, get your eyes off this. Get it on me. I'm going to take care of you. I'm developing something in you. They say, but Pastor Dan, does that mean that we don't believe God? No, you believe God. You go after it. You proclaim the promise, but you know that God is producing something in you far greater than the stuff. Get your eyes off the stuff. God will take care of the stuff. Get on to God. Believe God. Look to the one who promised. Look to the one who's perfecting you and changing you and molding you into his image. And that stuff, the Bible says, will come. Seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto you. God has no problem getting you the things. But God is more interested in your heart hello why me why me last thing for tonight is this helping anybody yes. praise the lord last thing for tonight this is the last one i like this one probably my favorite one out of all four of these tonight number four why me well here's why so you would know war you see what do you mean by that pastor turn me back to the book of judges judges chapter three very interesting section of scripture. Remember, we're talking about questions being answered. Why did God leave those nations? Well, test Israel. There was another purpose that God had in mind. The book of Judges tells us that there was a whole generation that grew up and didn't know the Lord. A whole generation that hadn't seen the signs. A whole generation that all they knew was what they heard from their parents and their grandparents. And to them, it was probably more like stories, fairy tales, than anything else. Because they hadn't seen with their eyes, they hadn't experienced what God has done. Yeah, they knew the sun stood still. Yeah, they knew that the waters parted. Yeah, they knew the walls came down. Yeah, they knew God created great victories for them. Heard about Egypt and the deliverance there. And yet, here they were, they didn't know the Lord, and they were getting off God. God wants us to know war. Look at this, Judges chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Judges chapter 3, starting in verse number 1. Take a look at it with me. Look at what it says. Judges chapter 3, it says, Now these are the nations which the Lord left. Remember, we were talking about why did God leave them? These are the ones that he left. That he might test Israel by them. Okay, now we already discussed that. We knew that God was going to test their faith with the, the, the presence of problems in their life. Look at the rest of this verse. Look at this. That is, all who had not known any of the wars... In Canaan, verse number two, in parentheses, look at what he's saying. This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. Here God stops for a moment, stops, I'm going to tell you the nations that are left, but let me stop and tell you the reason why. God lets us in on the secret. God answers the question. He says, not only to test them, but I want them to know how to war. That is, the people who didn't formally know war. I, 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 let me just encapsulate this for you. Let me get your attention. Let me, let me show this to you, God is saying, that this was only so the generations of the children of Israel might be taught, they needed to learn something, taught to know war, at least those who had not formally known it. Now, this blows our theological minds sometimes because we think about the promised land as heaven. We think that once you cross over Jordan, you've gone into the promised land, you've inherited the promise, and now you're in heaven, right? That's the process. You get delivered from Egypt, you cross the Jordan, you go to the promised land. I submit to you tonight that that is not totally correct. Yes, I do understand crossing over Jordan. Yes, I do understand but in the book of Revelation, it doesn't say the new Israel. It doesn't say the new crossing over Jordan, promised land. It doesn't say any of that. It says the new Jerusalem. 
So Jerusalem is the picture of heaven that we get in the New Testament. So what is the promised land, if not heaven? The promised land, then, doesn't become heaven for us. It becomes life after we receive Jesus Christ. In other words, God is showing us that as the nation of Israel inhabited the promised land, they took possession of the promise, that it wasn't something in the future, it was for here and now. For our life, living as a victorious Christian. Everybody tracking with me? Very important for us to know. Why? Because we got to know the war. Why do we have to know that? Because in life, you're going to experience problems. You're going to experience trials. You're going to experience pressures. Guess what? God didn't just leave nations in the land. God left giants in the land. And if they didn't know how to war, then there would be no David defeating Goliath. If they didn't know how to war, there would be no Jehoshaphat putting the praisers out in front and leading the people to a victory that had already been won. If they didn't know how to war, there would be no Hezekiah on the wall listening to the king railing at him and going and spreading out the sheep before the Lord and believing and trusting in God. See, if they didn't know how to war, they were going to have a life that was meaningless, purposeless, and that they would be put in bondage for the rest of their existence. God doesn't want Christians defeated on the earth. He doesn't want us broke down, busted, disgusted. When you look up and you say, why me? God says, because I want you to be strong. I want you to know how to war. I want you to go after it. I want you to take possession. I want you to have dominion. I want you to take my victory and use it on the earth. That's what God is saying to us. He wants us to know how to war. Their case and in ours, learning war means that we learn to trust fully on God and his ability to fight for us and give us the victory. That we go to war in prayer, we go to war in faith, we go to war when we speak the word and pull out our swords. God wants us to be victorious in life. Not going to happen if we sit back and we don't know how to war. Devil's going to slap us around. He's going to chain us up. We're going to be in bondage to every foul thing. My goodness, God wants his church ready, equipped, and out there. You can't endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ if you don't know how to war. You've got to know how to war. You've got to know how to do this. Love that. Charles Swindoll said, Every problem is an opportunity to prove God's power. Every day we encounter countless golden opportunities brilliantly disguised as insurmountable problems. Listen, there's nothing too great for your God. The Bible says all things are possible to him that believes. See, we, we got to get our minds off of the present reality that's staring us in the face and get us back into the reality of who Jesus is, what he's done, who our God is, how big is God. God created the heavens. God created the earth. God wrote the plan of redemption. God did this all on our behalf. See, that's what we got to get our eyes on. we got to get our faith out there and believe God in our life, and God will carry us through. Last verse for tonight. Last verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll close with this, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Turn there with me if you want. And in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, great verse. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, we're going to take a look at verse number 17. If you have some time later on, verse 16 and 18 are good too, but we're just going to take a look at verse number 17 for tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 17. Look at this, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When you realize that your time here on earth is only vapor, it's a very short time before you go and be in eternity, that's when you can read those words and smile, laugh at the problem. Why? Because it's a light affliction. It's not going to stop you, not going to hold you back, not going to keep you down. But it's just a moment, a moment in time. It's just a vapor, just a breath, just a twinkling of an eye. But it's working for us, working for us, not against us. Problem's not working against you, it's working for you. What? A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. What is glory? The manifested goodness of God. It's working in us to show forth the goodness of God in our lives for all eternity. Are you, are you with me tonight? You got something from the Word of God? Come on, give God a great big praise. Hallelujah. Just listen up right where you're at. God wants to speak to you. I want to talk to you guys before you leave this place. We've had a great time in the house of God. Laughed together, sang together. Some of us cried together. 
Had a good time in the Word of God. I really believe you got something from the Word. You guys were fired up and really believe that you got something from that Word. Thank you for allowing me to preach that, speak that into your life. Let's not stop there. I want to make sure before you leave this place that your heart is right with God and that if you died, that you'd go to heaven and not go to hell. The Bible tells us that we don't know the day or the hour that Jesus is coming back. He could come back at any time. But also, we don't know the number of days we have appointed on this earth. Too many times, we as pastors see people just one day they're here, next day they're not. It's a very real thing that we need to understand. We need to take very seriously that our life is but a vapor. It's a quick little moment here on the earth. And what you do with your life here and now determines where you're going to go for eternity. Sometimes people say, I don't believe in hell. Well, listen, hell's a very real place. It's talked about in the Old and New Testament. Jesus spoke about it. So just by ignoring its existence, burying your head in the sand doesn't make it go away. You're going to have to deal with this reality. God never intended for you and I to go to hell. He wants us to be with him in heaven. Hell was actually made for the devil and his angels. So let's make sure you don't go there. Make sure that you go to heaven. Sometimes people say, well, all roads lead to heaven. I, I'm going to get there because I hold to my truth, you hold to your truth, you know, and, and God's loving and kind is going to let everybody in. You know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that? Nowhere does it say you hold to your truth, I hold. You can't get there your way, my way, some well-meaning church committee's way. Got to get there God's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, well, that's good news because I know God's way is by being good. I've done more good than bad in my life. It used to be bad, cleaning my act, now I'm good. And, you know, I've helped out, gave money to charities and, and been real nice to my neighbors. And I believe that God's going to let me into heaven. Now, while I'm glad that you've been a good person, just could you show that to me in the Bible where that gets you into heaven? Because it's not there. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible says you can be good enough to get to, to heaven? There's no grading scale, no curve, no line that you have to be above, be this good, or let your good outweigh your bad, or whatever, clean up your act. Nowhere, nowhere in the Bible says be nice to your neighbors, give money to charities. God sees that and lets you into heaven. In fact, you can't be good enough because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it there on your own goodness. Sometimes people say, but I, I was raised in church. My parents told me you were Christians growing up. Had me baptized or Christian as a child. Hung a religious symbol around your neck like a cross or a St. Christopher. Maybe they, they took you to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, Sabbath school class. Always considered yourself to be a Christian. Born in America, America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians. Headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible. Check it out. Nowhere does it say that because you're raised in church... Your parents tell you you're Christian, that makes you Christian. In order to say that you wear religious jewelry, be baptized as a Christian as a child, go to religious classes, that that qualifies you for heaven. Not there. Nor in the Bible say that because you're born in America or that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. Come on, let's talk tonight. Let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, you're not going to make it. And I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. Now, sometimes people say, but you don't understand. Not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am sitting in church in front of you right now. Does not that mean I'm a Christian? I consider myself to be a Christian. I'm sitting in church. Now, while I'm glad you're here tonight, could you just show that to me in the Bible where it says you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It's like saying I could go to my house, sit in my garage, call myself a car, and that makes me a car. Mm-mm. Not going to happen. You can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. You say, but my last church, I got involved. I helped out, I sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as the leader, even got a membership card. Great, I'm glad you did those things. Just, just show that to me in the Bible, because you were your church involvement, gets you into heaven, where you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions, sing in the choir. People think of you as a leader. It's not there. Again, nowhere in the Bible do I see God is waiting at the gates of heaven, looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. It doesn't work like that. Now you might be thinking, but I know God. I know about Easter and the resurrection, celebrate Christmas every year of my life, sing the songs. I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament. That's great. Glad you did those things. But if you'd read your Bible, you'd know the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is and believes he's the Son of God and even quotes scriptures, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head that counts. It's not about head knowledge or mental assent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, but rather this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. 
Jesus made this statement to a religious leader of his day, probably better than all of us, more involved, more committed. This guy was a great man, a religious man in Israel during his day. And they were talking about the same thing we're talking about. How do you get to heaven? Jesus said, you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term, and many people turn off when they hear it, but don't turn off. Let me, let me describe to you what being born again really means from the Bible, because it's not about what society says. I don't care about what books, television, movies, all that kind of stuff says. I care about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart, that you've given God all of your life. That simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation. The last book in the Bible, Jesus is speaking to the church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he talking about? Lukewarm. What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you better look out. Why do I say that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment. Opportunity to give God all your heart and your life. To be born again. I'm going to do just like this. One, two, three, count to three, and then pop my hands together. When I say three, just like this. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence now. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'd be embarrassed. Uh-huh. You might be. Let's get over that embarrassment tonight. Why do I say that? Well, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. Yet tonight, you're going to try and talk yourself out of it. The devil's trying to push you away. You say, Pastor, you're being so aggressive. You're pushing me away. No, I'm trying to push you towards the things of God, towards the love of God, towards being born again. Why? Because I don't want you to go to hell. And so tonight, come on, you can give God all of your heart and all of your life in this safe and friendly place. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. Your call, your choice. Sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right. Or you can acknowledge your need for Jesus by simply raising your hand. This is your opportunity. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, give them all your heart and all of your life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? You're lukewarm in this place. You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can get right with God by simply raising your hand in a safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at watching by television, in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or if you're out there somewhere all over the world watching by the live stream, you can get right with God, raise your hand, God sees, and then we'll let you have some instructions right afterwards. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. Get ready. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. If you need to give God all of your heart, you need to give God all of your life. If that's you, just pop it up for me. Pop it up for me. Thank you. There's one, there's two. God bless you. Who else tonight? Need to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Who else tonight? Thank you. There's three. Gotcha. There's four. Gotcha. God bless you. You can put your hand down back there. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? There's four wise people already. This is crazy. This is crazy. I know there's more than four people tonight. I know there's way more than four people tonight. Maybe they all left. Maybe they're all out there in the foyer with their hands up. But come on, if you're in this place tonight and you know you need to do this, stop messing with God. It's time to get on the right path. Don't talk yourself out of it. Don't let yourself get so interested in the person next to you. Come on, focus in. God is speaking to you. God is tugging at your heart. If you need to do that, come on, right now. Be bold. Be bold. We're at number five. Come on. Come on. That's you. Just lift your hand up right now. Man, I wish I could make you do this. I wish I could bend your arm behind your back and kick your butt into heaven. I can't. I can't. You've got to make this decision for yourself. No one can wave a magic wand over you. That's not how this works. 
you got to come. Give it to God. He's not a manipulator. He's not going to talk you out of it. He's not a conniver. Take it from you. Not a thief. You got to do this. I'm going to give you another opportunity. If that's you, when I'm looking in your direction, just pop your hand up. Anybody else tonight? Come on. Come on, number five. Just raise it up high for me if that's you when I'm looking in your direction. Who else tonight? Come on. Let's go for God. Let's go for God tonight. Who else? Anybody else? I'm going to close this up and you're going to miss this. Don't miss it. You've missed enough opportunities in your life. Come on. That's you. Spirit of God is holding everything up just for you. God loves you so much. He's waiting for you. That's you. Come on. Lift it up high. Anybody else? Anybody else real quick? Come on. I'm going to close this up in a second. Go for it. If that's you, just pop your hand up. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. I've done my job. Man. Gosh. God is so waiting for you. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're all going to sing. As we do, we're going to give a clap and a shout. We're going to rejoice for the four that gave their heart and life, but we're also believing for you. That's you. You didn't raise your hand. When everybody stands and claps, that's your cue too. Everybody that raised your hand or if you should have raised your hand, when we all stand and clap and sing a song, as we do that, get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, purse, Bible, sweater, if you brought something like that. It's so hot out there, I don't know why you would, but if you did, bring it with you. Get a hold of a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet us up front. We're going to change destinies tonight. If you're out there in the foyer and you raise your hand, you come into the church service. If you're in the Love Rock Cafe telling us, or if you're online, press the blue button right now that says respond to God. Someone will lead you in a prayer. But inside here, come on, let's stand to our feet. And let's give a clap and a shout. And you come right now. If you raise your hand, you should have raised your hand. You come. Come on down. No one leave during this time. Very rude. Let them come right now. You just let them come. Anybody else if you need to come, just make your way to the front right now. Come on, nudge your neighbor. Say, come on, friend. I'll go with you. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. Apparently, I don't know how to count because there's more than four people up here. Praise God. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. God is good. Everybody up front, take a look up here. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. Came to give God all of your heart. Came to give God all of your life. Okay? I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. Right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel. Okay? Pastor Joel is a good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. Okay, I'm going to let you know what he's going to do in advance. So you're not wondering, what are, what are they going to do? Are they crazy? No. Listen, you already got past me. I'm about as weird as you're going to encounter tonight. He's cool. He's going to, number one, lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. That's awesome. Second thing he's going to do is give you some free stuff. A couple of booklets our pastors wrote that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then finally, thirdly, he's going to give you a friend. You say, give me a friend. What's up with that? Well, we have people in our church that we like to call a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer at the gym? Helps you get strong, make sure you're doing the right thing, right? Right exercises, right workouts, right eating habits, those sorts of things. Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. It's easy. It's free. He'll describe how it works to you, and then he'll let you come right back out. Now, listen, let me make a promise to you guys. Give us one year, one year of your life here at this church, sitting under the teaching and the word of God here at The Rock. At the end of that year and for the rest of your life, you're going to say, man, I'm so blessed. I never knew it could be like this. Is it tough? Yes. Problems and trials? Sure. But listen, it's going to happen anyways. Help us to get you strong so that you can endure and produce that godly character in your life on into the rest of your life, okay? Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right, praise God. You guys will make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe 
that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.